The subject of time has always fascinated people. We all start off thinking there's just the one time, the same for everyone. But Einstein's theory of relativity shows that this is not the case. Two people moving relative to each other, they have their own times and they're not the same. At normal speeds, me moving relative to you like this, at these sorts of speed, the difference between your time and mine is it, it, not obvious. It's, it's too tiny to notice. But at high speeds, really high speeds, the effects become enormous. Suppose, for example, we have a spacecraft and it's flying to a distant planet. And just suppose it's going at a speed equivalent to, well, let's say nine-tenths the speed of light around 270,000 kilometers per second. Not realistic, but you know, just suppose. At that speed, the astronaut's time will be going at half the rate of that of the mission controllers back at Houston. At that speed, everything happening in the spacecraft is slowed down by a factor of about two not just the rate of clocks and watches, but, uh, but also the astronaut's breathing rate, um, pulse rate, even his aging processes. It's time itself that is slowed down. It's called time dilation. Now, you might think that the astronaut would find this all very strange, living in a world of slow motion. But no. With everything slowed down, his thinking processes will be slowed down in, in the same ratio. And if you look at a slow watch with a slow brain, it appears normal. So for the astronaut, everything happening in the craft appears perfectly normal. It only appears slowed down to the mission controllers. But you might think, well, surely, you know, the, the astronaut will know his time has been going slow when he arrives at the distant planet in only half the expected time. No. There's a second effect of relativity theory. This is the situation as seen by the mission controller. Here we have the Earth, and this is the planet to which the astronaut is journeying. But according to the astronaut, this is what it's like. Relative speed affects not only time, but also distances. According to the astronaut, traveling at 270,000 kilometers per second, the distance from the Earth to the planet is only half of what the mission controller says it is. It, it squashed up. The Earth and the planet themselves, they're squashed up. In fact, any length seen to be moving relative to the spacecraft, according to the astronaut, will be squashed up. It's what we call length contraction. So we have uh, time dilation and also length contraction. The mission controller says your time is running slow. The astronaut says there's nothing wrong with my time. It's your distances that are squashed up. My journey took half the time because I've gone only half the distance. It all makes perfect sense except it doesn't agree with what the mission controller says is going on. OK, if this is the first time you've come across this sort of thing, then it, it all seems quite bizarre. But it's all been tested out and found to be true, not with uh, spacecrafts and flying about at speeds close to that of light, but, uh, but here. Uh, high energy physics laboratories like CERN, uh, just outside of Geneva.
Uh, here we can check out Einstein's theory using subatomic particles hurtling around the particle accelerator at, at speeds that are indeed very close to that of light. This is the, the Large Hadron uh, Collider. If you yourself were to travel at the speeds achieved here, you'd live to be half a million years old. That's time dilation. As I say, all this sounds very confusing. You know, different people having different ideas about lengths and, and, and times. But fortunately, there is something the astronaut and the controllers over there, in fact, all observers can agree on. It comes about like this. We're used to thinking in terms of uh, three-dimensional space. Up, down, sideways, backwards, forwards. Uh, so, three axes at right angles, like this. That, coupled with a one-dimensional time, past, future, uh, a separate one-dimensional time. Things changing in three-dimensional space as it moves up the time axis. But what if we're wrong? You know, what, what if they're, they're not separate and they are joined together, welded together to form a four-dimensional space-time? Uh, that's what we call it, space-time. What would we expect to find in this four-dimensional space-time? Well, whatever it is, it will have to be characterized by a particular point in space as measured along the three spatial axes, together with a particular point in time, as measured along the time axis. In short, we're talking about events. One event might be the, the launch of the spacecraft at the Earth, that's its point in space, the launch also taking place at a particular point in time, 3, 2, 1, blast off. A second event will be the arrival of the spacecraft at the distant planet at a later point in time. Now what one finds is that although the two sets of observers, the, the astronaut and the mission controllers, they, they don't agree about either the spatial distance or the time the journey took, they do agree about the interval between those launch and arrival events in four-dimensional space-time. And it's because everyone agrees about what the situation is in four-dimensional space-time that gives rise to the idea that what is real, you know, what actually exists, is four-dimensional space-time. Our, our familiar time and space, they're, they're nothing more than appearances, appearances of this, of this reality. Subjective appearances as seen from some specific point of view. Okay, now, what, what does that mean? You know, different appearances. Well, I'll take this pen. It has many different appearances, depending on, on the angle one is looking at it. You know, sometimes it appears short, but sometimes from, from another angle, from another point of view, it appears long. This is because all we see with, with our eyes or, or photograph with a, with a camera is, is a flat two-dimensional projection, a projection of something that, that is actually solid, you know, something that exists in three spatial dimensions, uh, not, not just, just, just two. So what we're saying now is that Space by itself is but a, a three-dimensional projection, a projection of something that is actually four-dimensional. And the time interval is nothing more than a one-dimensional projection of this four-dimensional reality. As Einstein once said, henceforth we deal in a four-dimensional reality, not a three-dimensional reality evolving in time. So that, that neatly solves the problem of those differing perceptions of times and distances. But does it? This four-dimensional space-time 
is sometimes called the Bloch universe. It encompasses all of space and also all of time. The whole time axis, past, present and future. This point here, that represents the present instant. And then on this side, uh, that point there is uh, when we started the program. And I say, the subject of time has always fascinated people. And, uh, and here on the other side, that's when I say, will we ever fathom the riddle of time? And the program comes to an end. And you can take a headache pill. It's all here, past, present and future, all on an equal footing. According to the, the Bloch Universe idea, the future already exists. It's, it's out there, waiting for us to come across it and experience it consciously. The Bloch Universe is static. Nothing, nothing changes in the Bloch Universe. Changes occur in time, all right? But time isn't out here. Time is in it. But if nothing changes, how can we experience a flow of time? Time rolling on. How can we have this impression that whatever exists is what is happening now at this present instant? The past, well, that has ceased to exist. It used to exist, but, but not now. The future, oh, we might try and guess what it'll be like, but we can't be sure because it doesn't yet exist. What we're talking about now is, is the mental experience of time, an experience that seems not to be reflected in the physics. In fact, the physics community is, is deeply divided over the concept of the Bloch universe. Now, while, while all physicists accept that observers agree over the you know, distances measured in this four-dimensional space-time, they don't agree over whether that necessarily means that space-time is, is real, that it's the reality, instead of some, or some abstract mathematical thing. So, does all time exist, including the future, in some sense? And if so, in what sense exactly? Will we ever fathom the riddle of time? Or is this another encounter with the boundaries of the knowable? Okay. Uh, Russell, I thought you said you needed less than 10 minutes for that section. How long did it take? Well, actually, it was about 12. Mm. Oh, it depends on, on how fast you're going. Um, yeah, why, why, why don't we get the viewer to, to, to get up and rush around the room whilst, whilst they're watching it? Uh, that'll slow everything down and uh, that should do the trick. No, oh, hold on. No. no, that would slow it. No, that's all right. That would make it seem even longer, wouldn't it? No, no forget I said that. Forget it. Cut. Mm.